So in the last decade, um, there's been a sudden explosion in teenage girls identifying as transgender. So my book explores why. Abigail Schreier's irreversible damage, the transgender craze seducing our daughters, was one of last year's most celebrated and condemned books. It showed up in year-end lists of top books, but was also banned by Target, and her publisher was disallowed from buying ads on Amazon. Abigail Schreier's book is a dangerous polemic with a goal of making people not trans, wrote an American Civil Liberties Union attorney on Twitter. We have to fight these ideas which are leading to the criminalization of trans life again. Schreier says she fully supports the rights of adults to undergo gender reassignment surgery. She's concerned that teenage girls are making irrevocable changes to their bodies that in coming years they might wish they could reverse. In a new paperback edition of Irreversible Damage, Schreier follows up on several of the women she spoke with and details her experiences of being deplatformed. Reason spoke with Schreier about the controversy over her book, The Streisand Effect, and the future of free expression in an increasingly polarized cultural landscape. Abigail Schreier, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you. Give me the elevator pitch for Irreversible Damage, the transgender craze seducing our daughters. So in the last decade, um, there's been a sudden explosion, really, in teenage girls identifying as transgender. Um, we've, we've never seen anything like this before. The, the um, underlying condition, gender dysphoria or severe discomfort in one's biological sex, is something that we've known about for 100 years, and it always predominantly afflicted boys and men. And now in the last decade, it's overwhelmingly teenage girls with no childhood history of gender dysphoria. So my book explores why, what's going on, why do so many young teenage girls suddenly decide that they want to leave womanhood, and why are so many doctors and therapists and teachers helping them? So let's uh, clarify a couple of things. Uh, you say historically the, the kind of move to have gender dysphoria or the idea that you're born in the wrong body or you're uncomfortable in the body you're in, typically that has been mostly men wanting to be women. Yes. Yeah. Overwhelmingly. I mean, yeah. the, the, do we know why that is or what, what do, uh, what do people say? Why is that? People have asked me that, you know, I'm not sure that we do. There are some attempts to do brain scans and right. find, you know, um, neurological differences. Um, but you know, for, for whatever reason, this did overwhelmingly afflict, um, boys and men. And, right. and so, if, you know, it, it, I think there's, you know, they estimate 0.01% of the, um, you know, for, for men are, are naturally transgender. That's what the right. DSM five, you know, right. um, estimated. Which and, is and the women, manual that talks about, uh, I mean, it's the psychi psychological psychiatric guide oh, yeah. of things. That's right. The psychiatric yeah. manual, the DSM five. And, um, for women, it was 0. 0.003. So you're talking mm -hmm. about tiny, tiny percentages, one in right. 30,000 women. Um, so basically no one you would have gone to high school with in the right. last decade. Now we have more than 2% of high school students. The recent, um, most recent surveys are even higher identifying as transgender and we know they're overwhelmingly teenage girls. So, so whenever you see, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. So. No, whenever you see something like that, it's just worth asking why. And that's, right. that's what my book does. So when um, when you say these are the overwhelmingly teenage girls and that it is, um, you know, they haven't presented this before. I have a, a good friend, a contributing editor at, uh, at Reason Magazine, Deirdre McCloskey, who is transgender and who transitioned in her 50s or around the age of 50. Um, and she talked about knowing from the beginning that she was a woman, even though she was in a man's body. I mean, she played football in college, et cetera. But what you're talking about are girls who generally don't have, or the, the specific subset you're talking about are girls who don't have a history of always saying, I want to be male. Yes, that's one of the peculiar sort of features of it is that the this always began in early childhood for those who had it. It's a real condition. Right. And now it's teenage girls with no childhood history, meaning they were perfectly comfortable p playing in princess dresses, never, you know, very often these girls liked, you know, ballet and all the sort of girly things. Right. And then they hit their teenage years. And this is the other peculiar feature with their girlfriends, because it very often happens in peer groups, decide that they're really transgender and they start clamoring for hormones and surgeries. And, you know, 
unfortunately today they're very, very easily obtaining them with almost no medical oversight. So let's talk a little bit about how the, the you know, part of um, what you talk about in the book is a kind of contagion theory. And, you know, in, I feel bad uh, kind of demonizing teenage girls, but, you know, one of the examples that people always reach for is the crucible or the Salem witch trials where you have something that, you know, obviously it's not about gender, but where a, bu a bunch of teenage girls kind of all have a certain kind of um, common uh, experience that, that, that oftentimes is considered kind of a social contagion. In a less enlightened time, it might've been called hysteria, but where people in a small group just get taken over with, with a similar feeling. Where, you know, where does the contagion come from? How does it operate? And um, you know, what do we know about that? Right, so we know that girls, um, th their modes of friendship are different from boys. Um, psychologists have studied this. I interviewed some for my book. Um, and we know that they tend to take on and share their friends' pain. Um, and they even take on and share their friends' reality, even when they know it's not true. So for instance, if, um, if a young woman is, they like to rehash bad things that have happened to them and really share each other's pain. So if a young woman says, Oh God, I feel so fat. Do you feel fat? The way that very often her friend would respond is, oh, I feel so fat too. Mm -hmm. And and it's that kind of thing that that of course spreads anorexia among young women. They tend to agree want to agree with each other, even even when they know it's not not true or right. And so they tend to spread these pure contagions. Bulimia and anorexia are classic ones that tend to perseverate if you put young women together. And now we're seeing that um, gender dysphoria seems to behave in the same way. Young women deciding that their real problem is that they're boys trapped in girls' bodies and agreeing with each other and spreading this through friend groups. You, you talk about um, within, within a peer group, there's usually one or two who are kind of leaders, right? Who, who kind of emerge with this feeling. And then I, I convince isn't quite the right word, but they kind of, they're the, the starting point of this. Yes. Um, so Lisa Littman did the, Dr. Lisa Littman did the research on this. And she showed that in friend groups, there was 70 times the prevalence rate now that's nothing we among teenage girls. We that's not something we'd ever seen before. What do, what do you mean um, by seventy percent or seventy times? So the seventy times rate? within friend groups, you would okay. see seventy times the rate of um, trans identification of you know um, and and claimed mm -hmm. gender dysphoria. Um, so many times what you would see in the normal population of the, the, the incidents you would normally see in the normal, in a yeah. typical case. Now that was never true historically, right? Well, there have always been what we used to call transsexuals right. and they weren't something that they were doing to agree with their friends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why, you know, transgender, you know, or what we used to call transsexual people, they weren't in groups of friends that all identified as transsexual. Right. They, you know, um, although they might, they, uh, you know, after they recognize the condition, they, they would might seek out. I mean, this is a, and not to put too much of a kind of cliche on it, but that's, you, you realize that and then you move, I mean, you know, I'm practically quoting uh, Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side, but like you, you understand something about yourself and then you, you get to New York City where you can be, a, where you find your tribe. Right. So the, the reason that we didn't think this was true for the teenage girls. So that's a good point. The question is, well, how do you know that these girls aren't just finding each other mm -hmm. because they all have the same condition? Well, the reason is, is these girls would suddenly come to this. They would have this epiphany within a very, very yeah. short period of time. So within a very short period of time, 50% of the friend group would suddenly decide they were transgender. Does um, it normally last? Um, I mean, because this is also part of, you know, I, we've, we've talked in, in various other conversations, we're both parents ourselves. And, you know, you never want to dismiss, you know, what your kid is saying when they come, you know, when they come around with a new passion. But there's also, a, you know, a parent uh, almost automatically will be like, okay, that's great. And then let's give it a little bit of time. Right. So um, the, the problem here is that they, um, you know, it is what we used to call a hysteria. Mm -hmm. These girls become passionately convinced that this is their problem. Remember, these, girl, these girls typically are suffering from other mental health problems. They're in a lot of pain. 
They have very high rates of anxiety, depression, and other comorbidities. Mm -hmm. They're in a lot of pain. They can become convinced by social media influencers and their friends um, that this is their problem. Teachers encourage this. They're, they're being taught this in school that only they know their true, true gender. Mm -hmm. and then the moment they declare a transgender identity, everyone celebrates them everywhere they go. And they feel this enormous pressure to transition right now, to medically transition. And the, and the real problem is there's no medical oversight. There's almost none. So they're able to obtain, you know, a process that used to take years um, and, and, and require medical, you know, oversight from a therapist to make sure this was a good, healthy decision. Now you just walk into a clinic and walk out that day with a course of testosterone. Well, let's talk about the, the steps that it takes to get, um, you know, a, a girl uh, starts to identify as transgender um, and in the book, you walk through a, a number of case studies or, or people that you talk to, both their parents as well as the kids themselves. And what, how do they, what do they encounter? Uh, you know, talk about the online experience of, of how that builds to a kind of certitude that what you're feeling is not just, um, you know, absolutely correct, but that there's a clock ticking that you, you really need to transition as quickly as possible. So there's, there's a lot of factors um, that go into this. Um, and, and one of them is these girls are very lonely. We know that this is the loneliest generation on record. Um, this is other psychologists work, it's not mine, but, but they have reported that it's the loneliest generation on record. They spend a lot less time in person with each other and a lot more time online. And they look to online older kids for advice about what, what they're feeling and how to understand what they're feeling. And there are a lot of very charismatic trans influencers who can't wait to advise them. They produce these incredibly, you know, um, they're very well produced videos, very watchable, and they convince young kids that if they feel uncomfortable in their bodies, it must be that they're transgender. And if they just start a course of testosterone, everything will get better. Mm -hmm. And the thing to know about testosterone is it does deliver a euphoria and it does suppress anxiety. So the moment these kids go on it, they do feel better. And then they can't wait to tell all their friends how everything gets better when you start T. So to, you, you mentioned before in the past, this time, when, when this type of um, situation would arise, there, it, it took longer to kind of get, get through the various stages. Um, you know, a, a girl, I, I mean, kind of the, the typical uh, count in your book is that a girl starts to feel a particular way. She either uh, talks with her friends who kind of sympathize with her or, or they go online and there are, a, a, you know, a whole kind of archipelago of, of uh, support groups, of activist groups and whatnot. So then they, they kind of learn the language and they learn the general kind of ideological makeup of, of what's going on. How do, they, how do they actually get things like puberty blockers and testosterone? Okay, so puberty blockers um, are typically require parents to go along with it, typically. Um, and they are, they are often a little younger than the girls I looked at. Mm -hmm. Because most of the girls I looked at were starting after, after they'd been through right. puberty. In fact, puberty is usually the crisis that brings on the thought that maybe I'm supposed to be a boy. Because they start hating their bodies around the time that they're going through these massive changes that every woman knows about that are really uncomfortable. Um, they're really dramatic changes to your and body. This is when, I mean, uh, yeah. not, and I apologize for being kind of uh, dumb about this, but I mean, that's, you know, puberty is the moment when boys and girls really separate physiologically yeah. as well. And the, the, you know, the effects on women are much more pronounced. They're much more pronounced. I mean, you go from inhabiting a body that's in many ways indistinguishable from a boy's in terms of strength and speed and you know you know your feeling of you know bravado in terms of what you can physically do to a body with a lot of vulnerabilities um a lot of pain because you know the onset of menses it's it, mm -hmm. it can be really painful and you're and and also you attract the attention of adult men for the first time long before you're ready for it. So you'll start noticing men your father's age looking at you sexually. Um, and it's a very strange feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of girls, and, and, and then today they have the added pressures of online pornography, which um, they, you know, the majority of them have seen, which is terrifying. And so can I ask, yes, I mean, yeah. you, know, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, going back 25 years or so when anorexia really kind of emerged as a, as a topic of conversation and it, 
it's always kind of interesting to think about how different generations or different eras have different kind of characteristic psychological issues that come up, you know, whether it was hysteria in turn of the century Vienna to something like anorexia starting in the 70s and 80s. But one of the, the main readings of anorexia was that it was a way for women to forestall puberty or sexual, you know, sexual, a sexual being, because when you stop eating, you, you stop menstruating, you lose your, your secondary sexual characteristics and things like that. Are you arguing that the kind of transgender identification as men or, or as male for teenage girls is kind of a way to cope with basically becoming sexually uh, um, mature? I, I think it is, yes. But I also think that these girls have less sexual experience. Mm -hmm. They are less likely to have kissed a boy or even held his hand than any previous generation. So they're really trapped in this body that has only negatives. Mm -hmm. And they haven't be even begun, most of them, to experience any of the, the pleasures of it. I talked to psychologists who, tell, who have told me, adolescent psychologists who have told me that they're shocked by how few of these girls have ever masturbated. Mm -hmm. um, because they, their, their bodies are, they're really tied to mom. They're very young, they're very sheltered compared to previous generations. And they're inhabiting a body that seems to be going haywire. So it's not surprising that they would wanna escape it. Um, so, okay, so younger people would get puberty blockers that generally requires, you know, parents going to a doctor or a therapist with the child. You're talking about people who are slightly older, they've gone through puberty, and now they want to take testosterone because that's the, the kind of difference maker here. That's right. And um, puberty blockers are usually admitted in the administered in the very, very earliest stages of puberty. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes puberty has begun, but you can't even tell because um, you're talking about Tanner, you know, one and two. These are very early stages of puberty. Right. But by the time a girl starts developing breasts and her period, um, she's actually very far along in pu in puberty, though she may only be 13 years old. And um, and at that point, they would go, um, you know, the, the pressure is to go straight to puberty, uh, sorry, testosterone, uh, because puberty is already, it can't be blocked anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the age of medical consent, and it varies by state, in Oregon, it, you can walk into a clinic and walk out that day at 15 years old without even a therapist note or your parents' mm -hmm. permission. So who is giving them the drugs or, I mean, are testosterone, is testosterone governed? Is it, I mean, do you need a doctor's prescription? How, how do you get it and in what form? So you do need a prescription, but, but often it's not coming from a doctor. You can, you can go see a physician's assistant and mm -hmm. clinics. We've gone from, I think there were two clinics or one in 2007, um, at one clinic in 2007, and a few years later, there were two. Now there are over 300. Um, so you, you're, you're seeing this burgeoning of clinics. Kaiser gives it out, Planned Parenthood gives it out. Um, and it's very easy to find one and go in. And, and frankly, at the public schools, the teachers, the activists, the online, you know, online, um, influencers, um, can't wait to tell you how to, st how to get testosterone. So they can't wait to coach these young kids on, on starting their new big change. What happens to a, a teenage girl who takes testosterone? Um, you know, and is it apart from, you know, any questions about, you know, whether this is psychologically good or bad, what are, what are the physical, um, uh, results and is there a problem there? So everybody's, uh, obviously hormones are a little different. Um, and so it has different effects on, you know, but, but in general, you tend to get a five o'clock shadow that may mm -hmm. never go away. Um, you you tend to broaden, it redistributes fat, which girls really like because they start, you know, when you go through puberty, you start getting fat in, in areas that, that bother you. Um, and, and it, it will redistribute them. Um, it gives you a euphoria, it gives you a feeling of empowerment. So you become socially bolder. Um, but you also, of course, end up with um, a really different physique. It, it can change your private anatomy. Mm -hmm. um, a young woman's clitoris will typically get um, larger and, and may even approach the size of like a tiny penis. So, um, sort of looks like a baby carrot. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, you know, their voice will change that that tends to be permanent. Um, it will do they at that point, do they become more sexually um, 
active, uh, you know, and by that, I don't necessarily mean with another partner, but you, you mentioned that a lot of the girls who start this procedure don't masturbate or they don't really have a physical pleasure to their body. Does that come with testosterone as well? So they do tend to have more sexual desire with mm -hmm. testosterone. The problem is once they start messing with their bodies um, by, by giving themselves these big changes, um, they, they often will wear a binder, which is a mm -hmm. breast compression garment. It flattens the breast. They, they actually aren't loving their body and they don't tend to want to undress in front of another person. Mm -hmm. So you don't see them um, being, you know, very often you don't see them being sexual. And this is something I've confirmed by talking to people in the, you know, trans community who have said to me, you know, I once said to one, does this seem like a cult of asexuality to you? And he's, and, you know, I, yeah, I interviewed um, Buck Angel, who's, you know, a porn star and, um, it's trans. You know, really a mentor to a lot of trans right. youth. And he said, yes, I mean, these kids are not are not sexually active very often. Does that and speak to the idea, though, that, uh, you know, because this is something that an earlier generation of trans people talked a lot about, that sexual um, desire and kind of gender identity are separate. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, I, who, what you feel like, what sex you feel like or what gender you feel like is an independent variable from what kind of who you desire or whether or not you want to have sex. I think it's true. That's true. But I think what's going on with these girls is when you're changing your body so radically mm -hmm. all the time, you, you're not <laughs> you're not necessarily so comfortable sharing it with someone else. So, for mm -hmm. instance, you know, mass double mastectomy, which these girls often go on to, it can be quite grisly. I mean, you know, it often takes several follow-up surgeries mm -hmm. to correct, you know, nipple placement. They lose sensation in the nipples, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is a sexual sensation. They lose that very right. often. I mean, it, it depends. But once you start going down this path, you're, you're, um, you may feel a euphoria from the testosterone. Certainly at first you do, but, but they don't, they don't tend to be in a position of being ready to um, you know, undress for another person. Um, when you, you say uh, some go on to, you know, having what's called top surgery, I mean, basically getting rid of female breasts and, and sometimes using musculature or in any case, you know, kind of achieving male breasts. I mean, so you don't need a binding garment anymore. What, what's the percentage of, you know, of girls who, who transition and then actually have top surgery, you know, by, I don't know, by the time they're 21 or something like that. Are there good numbers on that? Um, I would have to look up, you know, I, I heard recently that there are, you know, I, I heard a number quoted of how many girls are on waiting lists for top surgery. It was enormously high, um, but I haven't verified that yet. But you, you see, if you check GoFundMe, um, you know, I think there was in the tens of thousands of girls raising money for this surgery. Top surgery is a very popular surgery. Uh, we know that between 2016 and 2017, the number of young women, um, we, biological women undergoing gender surgery quadrupled. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a great interest in it. Um, and you know, a large percentage of these girls go on to get top surgery, especially because the breast compression garment often deforms breast tissue. Mm -hmm. But what they don't get is bottom surgery. Very small percentages of them go on to get bottom surgery, which mm -hmm. is probably, that's the phalloplasty. Right. That's probably a good thing. It's a, It can be a very, um, you know, a, a surgery that can go awry in all kinds of ways. And th this is something in the, the current discourse about trans uh, gender identity and whatnot that seems different than, um, I'm old enough to remember the 1970s when, uh, you know, people like Renee Richards, who was a, uh, had been a, a, a doctor, a male doc, a dentist, and then became a professional women's tennis player. There was a lot of emphasis in the 70s on kind of the, um, the surgery and the kind of mechanics of changing gender. That seems to be much less emphasized today. Um, well, yes. And so, you know, they, they're always saying anyone can be trans. It's mm -hmm. how you feel. I mean, that's right. part of the sort of the activism around it, that you can feel one way. They say you can be gender fluid, feel one way mm -hmm. one day. It's all a matter of feeling essentially. Um, yeah, that, that's very much the gender ideology, which goes along with a real 
a, a real con a condition. Gender dysphoria is a real condition. The activism mm -hmm. around it and the ideology around it, there, there you're really getting into some some witchcraft um, and and honestly a, a fairly incoherent set of ideas. Where, um, you know, what is your best understanding of where the activism comes from or what is enabling it? And, and again, we're not talking about for adults. We're talking about for for uh, teenage kids, for um, kids generally who are minors uh, under the age of 21 or 18, depending on the state. Um, you know, where where is that coming from? And, you know, and then talk a little bit about how uh, in the book you talk a lot about how social media and other new forms of kind of conversation help enable it. But where where's that initial kind of impulse coming from? So I think gender ideology is a really good parallel to um, critical race theory, because, you know, we've always had transsexual um, individuals and they were not revolutionaries and they were not angry and they were not looking to transition everyone and they weren't looking to uh, frighten women by marching into their, you know, you know, protective spaces or domestic violence shelters. They, they were very, you know, people who were able to have good pro jobs, productive lives, good friends, and they weren't they weren't trying to um, intimidate everyone. But the activists have taken up this cause in their name. Um, and this they do not represent the wonderful transgender people I've interviewed or, or come to know, um, but they have taken up their cause in their name and they are quite aggressive. They are the ones who make all the incursions into free speech and try to stamp out any any suggestion that you should ever halt medical transition. And it really is a, a kind of, you know, capture by these very aggressive, you know, minority of activists. What, um, you know, and I guess for, for the record, uh, could you, I mean, you are not against transgender people. You're not against trans, uh, transgender surgery or transition surgery for adults, correct? Yeah, not only am I not against it, I will say that I've interviewed a lot of transgender adults. And this is an incredibly, you know, um, major change to go through the physical change of undergoing gender surgery. And it used to be obtained after um, in conjunction with mental health uh, care and therapy. And I've always found that when I interview transgender adults, um, they are some of not only the kindest, but most thoughtful people I have known. Um, they really are, you know, they, they made this big change in their lives. So they have a lot of interest. It's as fundamental a change as, as one could imagine. Right. I yeah. mean, it's a big deal to go through and they sort of have this, you know, wisdom that comes with it. They, they really, I cannot tell, stress this enough, they couldn't be more different from these crazed activists who somehow have a great hobby of threatening me and, and whatever else, anybody else who dares to question immediate medical transition for, te for troubled teenagers. Mm -hmm. what, is the con what is the connection between trans activism and existing gay and lesbian uh, or LGBT, uh, well, I guess LGB, um, uh, activists and whatnot, because this is also something that you see increasingly um, people who have been very active in the fight for equal uh, equality under the law for lesbians and gays, bisexual, transsexual people are often at loggerheads now, or, or it seems like there's a rift between some of the more hardcore activists that you write about and the kind of establishment of, um, of sexual orientation or sexual liberationists uh, from a previous era. That's right. I mean, remember, they're, they're, they're very, very different populations, and they were looking for different things that I'm talking about traditional gay people or even transsexual people from the activists. Um, for one thing, gay people just wanted to be accepted as what they are. Mm -hmm. Transgender activists demand that you in, that you accept for them for what they are not, meaning you have to say I'm a woman because I'm I've decided I'm a woman. This is the demand of the activists. It's not the demand of most transsexuals I've talked to, but it is the demand who who are very sober. They don't deny who they were, but it is the demand of the activists. And I think a lot of gay adults went along with you know they were you know they saw this as a very vulnerable population. And they didn't want to speak out as these radical activists started, you know, getting going with their a, a lot of really extreme, be, you know, demands. What are um, what are some now. of the most extreme demands in, in your telling? Well, just the idea that you um, 
you know, they have tried to remove my book from libraries. Mm -hmm. They call me a threat or a danger, which is bizarre. Um, they, um, everything from you must, I mean, people are kicked off Twitter for saying anything, for not agreeing with the statement, a trans woman is a woman. Mm -hmm. um, that, that every fe woman's feminist organization now set, puts out these little policy statements, trans women are women, is it, quite absurd. Trans women obviously are trans women. Right. Um, other people have made this point. It, uh, uh, you know, that's just true. They are trans women, but they, you know, what we call trans women, but they're not women. Um, they have different mm -hmm. biology from women and there's nothing so that, wrong but, with that. And, yeah. and you're not at any point, you never suggest that they should be accorded different, uh, you know, kind of different legal standing or anything like that. No, I mean, I fully support, you know, full civil rights for transgender people, of course. Um, the only question is, I, I, I think that a real discussion needs to be had before we consider all, you know, transgender women or, or biological males who say they're women exactly equivalent to to biological women under the law, meaning before they flood women's prisons, we need to have an open conversation about how to keep women safe from biological men who are convicted felons mm -hmm. um, and have undergone no surgery. I mean, that's just a conversation that needs to be had. And the activists find the even possibility of that conversation intoler intolerable. Um, do you, I, I mean, would you grant, uh, and, and again, you know, your book, it's funny because if you approach this book, having read about it, depending on, you know, who, whose reviews or whose glosses you've read, you'll either be like, well, this is a breath of fresh air and it's, uh, you know, it's a reality grounded discussion of something uh, that uh, particularly parents will understand or your history's greatest monster since Jimmy Carter. Um, you, you can understand, though, why a trans person might be like, you are denying who I am or you're denying my reality. Is, uh, would you agree with that? No, I, I don't think I am at all, okay. because I actually think these girls have misdiagnosed themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they, they aren't like trans, you know, transsex, what we used to call transsexuals and we now call transgender adults at all. Mm -hmm. They are very troubled teenage girls. And their um, gen their claimed gender dysphoria is is obviously atypical. Um, it doesn't have the features of typical gender dysphoria. They don't have a childhood history of it. They are um, they they demand testosterone and and top surgery immediately. They talk mm -hmm. about they fixate on it. And by the way, detransitioners, young women who went through this and then detransition, talk about this. They say I was so fixated on the idea that if I just transition. I, you know, it felt so urgent. I need to get testosterone right now. I can't wait another day. That's what they say. This is not how transgender people talk about their transition at all. Mm -hmm. um, they're much more sober about it. They're much more calm. It's simply what they have come to, you know, as as an as an adult after a period of trying to resist this, they they decide, you know, that's how I'm most comfortable. But it's not hysterical. Um, it's not the fevered urgency that these girls seen, and it's not done with girlfriends, with the celebration of their peers in school. It's 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 really done after a period of you know sober contemplation, often with a with a therapist. Uh, let's talk about um, you know in the the paperback version of the book, you've updated a number of uh, aspects, you've added material. Uh, let's talk about the reception, or, or actually not the reception of the book, but you experience and you've alluded to it. At various times, there were campaigns to kick you off of Amazon. Uh, Target, the the um, which was selling the book for a while, took it off its uh, catalog or whatever or online sales. Um, what was what what was going on with your book? Um, you know, what was your experience in terms of being deplatformed at various places? It, it's it's really it's really been wild. So the most extreme activists. They see the book selling well and that it's, you know, broadly liked, very good Amazon reviews and whatnot. And they decide to flex their muscles. And their one Twitter user complained to Target and said, This book's transphobic. You need to get rid of it. And unfortunately, American companies today have no spine. If, if they hear that kind of complaint, they immediately say, Okay, we don't want to be transphobic. And they deleted it. Mm -hmm. They deleted my book. There was public outcry. They put it back. And then they quietly deleted it again. Hmm. Um, I was actually contacted by a Target employee um, who was extremely upset about this, who sent me some of the internal communications. 
And they were constantly going back and forth. People were saying within the company, there's nothing transphobic about saying that teenage girls should have medical oversight mm -hmm. and some gatekeeping before they immediately start a schedule, you know, a, a schedule two controlled substance. And, um, and, you know, there's nothing transphobic about that. But today, everyone just immediately bends to the extreme activists. And even though activists are saying something, almost no one believes. I mean, you know, I have gotten an outpouring of support, most of it quiet to my inbox, but from across the political spectrum, people saying, hi, I'm a, you know, far left on the pol political spectrum, but I just read your book. And frankly, I agree with all of it. What uh, uh, are you on Target now? Are you being sold at no, Target? They never no. brought it back. They took okay. it off again. These what about the what about at Amazon? You are it's available yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, Amazon what, had... what was your experience at Amazon? Well, first of all, Amazon, you know, they they refused to allow um, ads for the book. They refused mm -hmm. my pop publisher the opportunity to sponsor ads for the book. So they they played various games, but Amazon had a committee read the book. Uh, searching for transphobia, mm -hmm. and um, they have this Glamazon, you know, committee that was that that was demanding that it be removed, and um, they had a full, they appointed a full committee to read every page of the book, and they found that there was nothing transphobic right. in it. And um, Amazon, more recently, in response to a, a couple of uh, inquiries by uh, Republican senators or conservative senators. Uh, talking about the book When Harry Became Sally, um, which they did deplatform. They said that they, uh, Amazon issued a statement saying that they were not going to carry books that talked about uh, transgender um, identity as a psychological, you know, malady. Uh, but your book is up there and running. It's up there and running. I mean, I don't, you know, I, you know, what was done to Ryan's book, you know, that's Ryan Anderson's book, right. I think is awful. Um, but there are distinctions between yours and his. In terms yes, of I mean, I, I my book's not political. Right. Um, I didn't really look at the politics of this movement and I didn't look at, um, it, it really isn't about policy right. or a particular political perspective. It's just about a medical mystery. Mm -hmm. I really did a, a journalistic investigation of what's going mm -hmm. on with when teenage girls suddenly decide together that they're transgender and, and why are so many mm -hmm. adults pushing this or how why is it so easy for them to get these really serious, um, you know, controlled substances and whatnot. Um, so, so that's what it looked at. I don't diagnose the transgender identity mm -hmm. as, you know, I never do that. I, I don't think it's a medical condition. Um, and as for gender dysphoria, well, that's, in, you know, that's in the DSM. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the DSM right. considers, you know, the, the psychiatric manual considers that a mental health disorder, right. but, but do I think, um, you know, I, I have, you know, do I think it's a disorder? Well, in this, in the sense that, you know, I have met transgender adults who are leading very productive, very good lives. I certainly don't think it's, it's something that inhibits that. Um, so, you know, I don't, well, I mean, your book is not transphobic. No, right? it's not. So, I, mean, I mean, it shouldn't be banned on by Amazon's own statement. Right. I, I think it's more, this is what I, how I understand the activists that they, they are very much testing the, the waters. They are very much pushing the limits and they want to see what they can get, you know, how much they can shove people around. And they have picked this issue in part because the other side is so reasonable. Um, and if they can insist that you say that trans women are women, if they can win on that, they can make you say anything. Well, but there, I mean, are you saying that, okay, well, you know, so trans activists are going to march from that issue to a bunch of other things, or, I mean, or is it just that trans activists, you know, really believe what they believe and they're going to push within that kind of subject area as far as they can? So, yeah. And by the activists, I don't mean transgender people, okay. but the, the activists, these gender ideologues, will they move on? I don't think they have a big plan except chaos. I think they really are trying to disrupt the family. I think they really are trying to disrupt American life. And I do think they are looking to recruit revolutionaries very much the way Black Lives Matter operates. Hmm. What do you mean? Can you extend that a little bit? Sure. Um, well, I think that when you, when you object to the term mother, okay? Hmm. Oh, we have to get rid of the term mother. That has, it can only be, you know, gestational parent. You're, you're really, you're, you're, you're pushing demands so irrational 
um, and so frankly anti-family because of mm -hmm. course no one becomes a parent hoping to become a gestational carrier. Right. They do it because they want to become a mom or a dad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is just a really way of making family and the goal of family you know, far less attractive. Mm -hmm. They are clearly have their sights set, I think, on America and American life. They really want to disrupt as much as they can, and they are. They are absolutely assaulting free speech. They say that we have to change our vocabulary everywhere. And that is the, I am a she, they. Mm -hmm. You know, these are my pronouns, she, they. I'm just gonna see if you can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm a good English speaker, but you know, like many people would find it very confusing and very hard to use she, they pronouns with someone. I, uh, I have to admit, and I say this with the authority, limited as it may be of a PhD in English, I don't worry too much about pronouns um, because you know we end up talking, you know, people know what you mean and who you're talking about. But can I ask then, you know, there's an irony though, if you're saying like today's trans activists are, are kind of working to undermine the family, and in a way that puts them at odds with radical feminists of yesteryear, who oftentimes were explicitly anti-family. They thought the, the family was a site of patriarchal uh, repression and whatnot. But now you have, part, and this seems more pronounced in England for reasons I'm not exactly clear, but you have an older generation of radical feminists, the Jermaine Greers of the world, who are very much at odds with today's trans activists. Right, I mean, I think that in a time when gay people and lesbians had less rights, mm -hmm. um, less ability to have their own families. I think they did have some umbrage, understandably, um, at the family structure. And now that they've been so included in you know, marriage mm -hmm. and family life, you know, my book has broad lesbian support, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, lesbians are very concerned that young women who might naturally just become lesbians are instead dramatically changing their bodies and denying that they're women and that they're going to regret it. I mean, that's right. that's why I wrote the book. I did. If these girls were going on to lead happy lives, I would not have written the book. I don't care. I and would not. Talk, have yeah. Cared. How how do you know? Or, or I mean, and in the book, you talk a little bit about uh, in follow up to some of right. some of the particular people you talk about, but in broad statistical terms. Is there, is there good data to say that girls who go through transition or, or go on to um, you know, testosterone or having top surgery you know, before the age of 18 or 21, are they more or less likely to feel good when they're 30? Or, or is it too soon to even be able to understand you know, where that might end up? It's a little soon, but, but I will tell you what we do know, okay? The thousands and thousands of, de of detransitioners, young women who say they regret it, are already populating YouTube every week. It's unbelievable how many women will have come forward and say there was a big case of this in England. Kira Bell sued the Tavistock Gender Clinic in England. Mm -hmm. Young women are coming forward more and more all the time. And remember, there's a very new treatment. It didn't used to be that a young woman could get these surgeries. So now that they are, we're finally seeing. Mm -hmm. And it, in this population of young women who have regretted this is exploding. We know that there's a lot of regret already. But there and are the ones who are like, no, no, this actually, it's worked out well. Say it again. Are there? Uh, but, yeah. I mean, but there are also women who are like, no, this was a good choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, there are ones, I, I think, first of all, most of the regret is yet to come mm -hmm. because this is fairly new. But are there, you know, certainly there are many transgender adult, adults I've talked to who seem very happy in it. Um, and are there going to be teenagers who do, I mean, I've talked to adolescents who seem, you know, who transitioned to adolescents are now in their mid twenties and they're still happy with it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely talk to them. The problem is of course, is that there's absolutely no medical adequate medical oversight. Mm -hmm. So no one is making any attempt to separate the girls who are, you know, young women who are likely to be happy with this mm -hmm. from those who are very highly likely to regret it and suffering from a lot of other comorbidities. And would it be accurate to say, I mean, one of the things that you're basically arguing is that, you know, instead of rushing into uh, conversion therapy, um, it's, you know, you're saying like stretch it out a few years to see if this is actually a, a long lived condition as opposed to a, you know, a, a kind of phase that might resolve itself either in a, in a, in a girl becoming, you know, heterosexual or lesbian down the road a little bit. 
Right. I mean, there, there's no differential diagnosis given today. The, the standard every medical organization has adopted is a, a, every medical accrediting organization mm -hmm. is affirmative care. So the doctors are all rep stamping this. The problem is a lot of these girls are just going through angst. I mean, really serious. They, they have anxiety and depression, but I, I, you know, I've interviewed a lot of them. I've interviewed a lot of their parents and already we're seeing young women come forward and say, wow, I can't believe I thought gender was my problem. I had a lot of other things no one wanted right. to talk about. Um, to go back to the question of speech, you raise an interesting question, and I think a lot of people would totally agree with the idea that activists, certainly in the trans space, and, and particularly about adolescent girl transitioners, um, you know, they seem to be attacking anybody who disagrees with them or anybody who challenges anything. And that's an attempt to kind of suppress speech, whether it's done, you know, through uh, kind of legal means or through kind of uh, changing cultural mores. What about Amazon or Target's free speech rights? Uh, you're a lawyer by training, right? And does you know does Amazon and in their statement to you know Repub to uh, explaining themselves uh, to uh, Senator Republic a bunch of Senate Republican senators they said you know what we have a right to decide what we're going to carry on our platform and you know as a libertarian. I am a massively in favor of all free speech. I think, you know, I, I want more free speech always. I think Twitter, um, you know, and Facebook, they restrict too much speech in the name of, you know, whatever their terms of service are. But fundamentally, does Amazon have a right to say, you know what, we're going to carry this book, we're not going to carry this book. Okay, so I want to, I'm going to address that. But first, I just want to correct one okay. tiny thing. Sure. And that is the activists are not teenage girls. The right. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Are biological men. Yeah, um, they are shutting up speech about a condition mm -hmm. afflicting teenage girls. OK, and they are overwhelmingly biological men. Okay. Um, so do I think Amazon has a right to choose what it wants to carry or target? Well, a few things. Of course, it chose it was carrying my book. They chose that. Mm -hmm. And then they and then activists complained. And then they, they decided activists have decided what other adults are allowed to read. But there's also a problem when you're that market dominant, when you have that large a market share. The problem is the reality is with Amazon today that books that Amazon does not carry or that activists can strip from Amazon will never get published in the first place. You can't take a chance on an author that might be deleted by Amazon as a publisher. Hmm. You can't take a chance as an agent on an author that might be deleted. OK, so you will start to see these not getting published at all. That's what that's the difference between the local bookshop saying, hey, we just sell Marxist yeah. books. This book isn't for us. And Amazon, mm -hmm. which controls most books that are published. Do you think and, you know, and it's interesting to phrase it in that way, because I know kind of smaller publishing houses or smaller authors where that seems very likely to happen. In a way you've had, and you're published by Regnery, which is a major press, it's conservative, but it, you know, it's got great distribution, it's got a great marketing arm, both in terms of direct sales as well as being carried everywhere. Is there something of a Streisand effect where you actually, and I, I don't wanna say you, you, know, you relish this, but where you're, the, the tribulations that you went through in terms of this being on Amazon, being kicked off, being on Target, being kicked off, actually may have given you more publicity. So in some cases, you know, this actually is kind of a, a, a decent outcome for you. So here's what I will say. Um, did I sell more books because of the controversy? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But an author doesn't, I mean, at least I am not principally concerned about that. Why? Because they could delete my book at any time. They could delete anyone's book at any time. OK, whatever I make from the you know, book sales, you have to look against a free a society that mm -hmm. could delete me as an author tomorrow and Amazon that could make my book vanish tomorrow. And that, Meanwhile, by the way, you're literally, set, you know, like, I mean, it is true that with Kindles, um, you know, this is something that is, you know, I both I love it because it's a it's a fantastic technology and it allows me to carry, you know, literally hundreds of books in, a, you know, a pay, you know, in a very thin lightweight device, but literally they could zap your Kindle library overnight because they own exactly. it, you don't. Exactly. And think about it this way. I don't think and they what? will do that. But I mean, this is, 
I'm interested in, you know, it, you're talking about here more broadly about a kind of culture of free speech uh, rather than whether or not, I mean, because you would agree Amazon has a legal right to basically do whatever it wants. Uh, well, you know, I don't know when you're okay. when you're that market dominant. Okay. I think that really you're affecting the speech that adults can read. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure you do have the same legal rights when you're that huge. Okay. This, I think, I think what we certainly disagree about that, but I hear where you're coming from. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think scale matters. Yeah. If, if Amazon, let's say Amazon controlled 90% of the books right. sold, should it be able to? Well, that that's effectively, you know, eliminating yeah. books from every American library. I'm not right. sure that that should be allowed. You are, uh, you're giving the Supreme Court, which is going to be hearing cases about this, you know, very, uh, you know, in the, in the near future, I'm sure you're giving them uh, material to think about with that for sure. I think we have to, but the bigger, the bigger issue is I don't want to live in an America mm -hmm. that decides what adults are allowed to read. That's a really dark and ugly place. It really is. And I don't think that they will stop with me or my book or Ryan Anders. I think they will keep going. I mean, I think that's very alarming. Now my book happened to, you know, look, I, you know, I wrote, you know, I was, you know, I wrote it very intentionally and I, you know, certainly I'm not transphobic at right. all. I mean, I fully support medical transition and civil rights for transgender people, but um, I'm alarmed. I'm really alarmed by a society that would go around digitally deleting books. Yeah. Um, and you and, don't think yeah. that, you know, uh, say a regnery uh, and related people would come up with an alternative or a parallel distribution network that would allow that because I, you know and again i want to come back i realize you 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 do not identify as libertarian but this is you know it's an interesting dilemma for uh for libertarians i think in particular because we believe in absolute you know maximum free speech rights but also maximum property rights right and and the idea that you would compel speech on any level to say well you've you know because you have a big market share because you've been very successful you have to carry everything even if you don't want to that you know, you, you can appreciate that dilemma. Well, I can. The problem is that, you know, I, I think scale matters, mm -hmm. right? So I think that, you know, you're talking about a tiny group of minorities who are calling the shots mm -hmm. for what the American public could read. The point of the book is it uncovered a medical scandal about whether these girls are getting appropriate mm -hmm. medical care and oversight. That's a debate that must happen. Yeah. And even if I'm proven wrong, which I don't think I am, I think I'm right. But even if I were ultimately proven wrong, the idea that you can delete and silence, you know, a, a legitimate investigation is really troubling to me. Um, I, you know, I don't think every book should, you know, that you should be able to demand that every bookshop carry every book. But I do, I do think that there's something very different going on today. And I'll tell you what, what you know, I don't think our laws are prepared to have um, to deal with what we've got. I mean, just to give one example, defamation law is almost impossible. It is almost impossible in America to sue for defamation right. today and win. Yeah. OK, the problem is it's never been easier to defame someone on a mass scale. You can defame someone and put out all kinds of lies about them and have millions of people read that with no recourse. This isn't some guy distributing flyers. These are permanent flyers that never leave the internet that are distributed to millions of people. To me, it's very obvious that our, our defamation laws, we're not prepared for that. Do you feel though that defamation, you know, is a, a good example where because it's so much easier to defame people, people are less likely to buy, you know, a defamation charge. I, you, the, you, the, you know, as it becomes easier to spread, you know, comments about people, the bar for people to really believe that or, or, you know, act on it gets raised. I think that's true, but gosh, that really, we're really, yeah. um, you know, assuming a system that, that is, has integrity in America. Mm -hmm. So we're assuming a system in which our newspapers then don't repeat those lies. Mm -hmm. We're assuming a, you know, a judicial system that has integrity that doesn't take those lies as evidence of anything. I'm, I'm very concerned about institutional corruption in America today. Yeah. And I don't think mass publication on the internet of lies is is something that no one needs to worry about. Right. Um, well, what's the best way to def, uh, to push back against that? Because again, like we don't want 
we don't want to become even more litigious, right? Where everybody is suing everybody all the time about this or that. And I guess you had talked more broadly, and I'm, I'm very much in sympathy with this of a, you know, we should have a culture of free expression and of open expression and open debate in, in, in the public sphere. Um, what are the ways that we might get back towards that, where instead of trying to, you know, we live in an age of cancel culture where people are constantly trying to just shut down whole areas of debate. Um, what are the ways that we kind of open things up? You know, I, I'm really with you on the radical free expression. I really don't think we should put these companies in the business of deleting people's um, speech, especially when you cannot trust the mean the ways they will do it. And I think that adults should be able to hear, you know, all kinds of theories about what's going on and decide for themselves what they want to believe. Um, and, and I don't like the fact that these big tech companies can put their fingers on the scale, their thumbs on the scale and affect, you know, the debate by silencing one side. Right. So what, um, but in terms of a larger culture of, of kind of open expression, um, you know, are, are there things we can do beyond? Because I mean, you know, I, I suspect that you would agree that, you know, the only thing scarier than Facebook deciding what is or isn't misinformation or disinformation is, you know, the people in Washington, right? Or, or bureaucrats. At but the they're FTC. working together now. Yeah. They're working together now because you have a situation in which what's getting um, censored happens to be the stuff mm -hmm. that the administration right. doesn't like the narratives that don't look good for the administration that's what's so alarming mm -hmm. it's not that these not only that these companies are making these decisions but that it's 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 you know something favor the the, the administration is in perfect alignment right now with mm -hmm. that censorship that's that to me is extremely right. troubling. But then, what do you do? I mean, do do uh, you know? Audrey Lord uh, said that you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Can you stop? Uh, you know, can you stop the censorship? You know, by government with more censorship by government, or you know, how, how does where do we go from here? I think that once these, you know. Um, companies become large enough and open themselves up and become basically public squares, hmm. they cannot censor what wow. goes on it. Okay. Um, and well, I include hate speech in that. Yeah, that is, I, I we definitely uh, don't agree on that, but I appreciate the, uh, you know, the, the logic that you take to get there. What happens uh, next for, um, for you and for your book where, um, you know, what do you have a follow up planned or what um, what what do you hope to achieve with the I guess with the release of the paperback? Oh, um, you know, I, you know, looking forward to more people, you know, getting a chance to to read it. I think, you know, the reception has been very good. It's very mm -hmm. reasonable and it, it's very eye opening. I think parents need to know um, what what all the ways that their decisions as parents are being undermined mm -hmm. right now, how little say they actually have and how much power we've shifted to teenagers, even to cause themselves, you know, harm um, in, in all kinds of ways they're very likely to regret. One of the, uh, you know, one of the interesting subtexts of the book, or, or not quite a subtext, but a thread throughout is that, um, you know, it is simultaneously the best time ever to be a woman and to be a girl to be growing up now. And it is also incredibly daunting. Can you talk a little bit about that paradox where, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's the best of times. And in some ways that makes it, um, much more difficult growing up to become a woman. I think it's a really hard time to be a woman in a lot of ways, not not because of material opportunity. We've never had so much material opportunity. More girls, of course, are, are going to college and getting right. graduate degrees and, and whatnot. But um, there, there are a few things that make it really hard to be a young woman. Um, first of all, online porn. Um, it sounds tame. It sounds like, oh, just Playboy on your on your computer. Mm -hmm. But actually, these young girls at very young ages, um, you, you know, I think the the average age at which young kids first see um, pornography is, is somewhere between eight and 11. It's very young. Um, I, they're, they're seeing women choked within an inch of their life during sex. This scares the heck out of girls. And they tell their therapist that, that they find the idea of sex really frightening. Mm -hmm. um, and young men watch this and then think they that is the kind of, you right. know, sexual life. And young for. men are also having less sex 
than they are. you know those of us of earlier generation less less enlightened generation much less they're high, having much higher rates of sexual dysfunction we've never seen so much erectile dysfunction mm. Um, in, in this population of, of men who used to be able to, you know, that was one thing we could count on them for is, you know, sexual desire <laughs> and ability to sexually perform. And right, right. now they're struggling um, and, and they've linked this to porn. Um, so there are a lot of scary things about being a young woman. I think that the, a lot of young women were scared by things, narratives spun by the Me Too movement. I think they, the ideas that ever, you know, one in four women is sexually assaulted on campus it's a really scary way to go off to college. Mm -hmm. um, it's not true, and and it's a you don't want to go to go to college thinking you're going to be one in four of you will be raped. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that a lot of things are really scary for young women today, even though they they do have material opportunity. Oh, there's the, there's also just the idea they'll be attacked for their privilege by their peers. Mm -hmm. They'll be told that. Um, no matter what they've gone through, no matter what they've personally overcome, you're a white girl and you're privileged and nothing you say counts. Hmm. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways that young women are being beaten up on. Today. Are you are you optimistic about the future in general for, you know, either American society or for, you know, today's teen girls? Well, I don't know if I'm optimistic. I, I think that this problem, the problem I talk about, I think that will get turned around. Um, I think, look, we're in a period of, of, uh, you know, unusual chaos, I think. Um, and I, I, I do hope, I mean, I think this country is worth very much worth saving and gosh, you know, here's my take. I'm not a very political person. Um, um, the book, as you mentioned, has a conservative publisher in, in England, the identical book has a non conservative you know, a, uh -huh. a non-conservative publisher. So um, I, I'm not a terribly political person. Um, I, I, I'll i tell you what I care about today. I care about things like free speech. I care about equal protection. I care about due process. I care about the rule of law. And I think they're all being threatened right now. Yeah. And that's what I care about. I, I don't, you know, various issues of various parties are not something that interests me terribly. Yeah. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Uh, we've been talking with Abigail Schreier, the author of Irreversible Damage, the Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. Abby, thanks for talking. Thank you.